Gadget UK here again. Um, I'm just about to fit the 68,000 uh, socket on this ST, um, which I'll require for the mod because uh, the chips just sold directly onto the board. Done the first two pins there. They only take a second or two each. Best way to do this is to heat the pin up with a, a tiny bit of solder with containing flux, and then uh, you know after you've heated it for maybe a second or two, uh, use a desolder pump or use a desoldering station. I could use my desoldering station, but it's in the loft at the moment. Um, can't be bothered to get it down just for the purpose of doing this. It's, uh, it's only taken me maybe 10 seconds each to do those first two pins. So, and then after you've done it, what you do is turn this board over. Uh, where's the pins I've done? First two pins, you can see there. Basically, you want to use a flat blade screwdriver and press, well, you can see this, just press it away from the board. Sometimes it'll make a little snap noise as it disconnects. Do that a few times, and then on the other side of the board, Again, using a flat blade screwdriver, just sort of put a bit of pressure on each side of the pin, wiggle it from side to side until it comes free. Don't put too much pressure on, don't bend it too much, you'll obviously break the pin off. That's the easiest way to get these off. Um, I'll cut back again in a minute when I've uh, done a bit more. Yeah, here's a quick update. Uh, they don't live very clean at the moment because I've not cleaned them up with ice prop or anything, and the board's got a few little marks there from flux. That's just it, trust me, it's flux, it's nothing else. Uh, you can see there's one pin there, the Earthing pin, that connects to that big earth plane. It might even be a power plane, I don't know, I've not checked this pin out. Uh, still needs uh, a little bit of work. If you get a problematic pin like that, leave that to last. Um, it's much easier. You might need to even heat that one pin and all the others loose, you know, sort of loose. Heat that one pin up while you gradually sort of try and ease the chip off the board. But uh, the other ones are all okay. Um, some of these have only taken one sort of, you know, put the solder line on there. It's only a 15 watt on the tech I'm using here. It's a really cheap, cheap job. You don't need anything fancy for this. Um, heat the pin up for between two and five seconds. Um, and obviously, you know, press the button on your solder sucker, um, see what the thing's like. If you're getting a problematic one, try and keep the soldering iron on there all the time, even after you've used the solder pump. It takes a bit of work, you might need to move the iron at a different angle and stuff, but just to keep heat on there to, um, you know, to, 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 to make sure that the solder's flowing through the other side of the board. Um, for really problematic pins, I know it sounds daft, but put more solder on there. Um, with flux, obviously it's the flux that does the trick. Um, it sounds counterintuitive, I know, but if you put um, more solder, even a really big blob of solar flux, and heat it for four or five seconds, and then start using the solar sucker, um, you'll find that it's uh, pretty easy work. Uh, I'm doing another update when the, the other side's done. That's only taken about ten minutes to do that side. Some of them were a bit more problematic than others. Just a really quick uh, shot here of me just, uh, just doing a few of these, just so you can see what, what I usually do. Put some solder with some flux on to start with. Heat it for three to five seconds. There you go, most of that's gone. You need to continue heating it, heat it again, maybe three to five seconds. And I usually do this two or three times just until there's no, no solder left on there at all. And then every few seconds, give it a little white with a nylon brush to make sure you get on the little fine particles of solder off there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, finally, you just wiggle each pin. I don't know if you can see this. Wiggle each pin with the uh, end of a flat blade just lightly. And you can usually tell, you only have to press a little bit, you know, you know, eighth of a millimetre or something in each direction. But you can usually tell when you freed it, when it's loose, because it will move relatively easily. Uh, most of these are pretty free, to be fair. You don't want to bend them too much, or you will break the end of the pin off. Right, well, I could pretend this all went really well and cover it all up, and you'd never know because I've got spare CPUs. As you can see, uh, the board, uh, the board's nice and clean now. Uh, there's a couple of little nicks there where I've, uh, you know, tried to get a bit of leverage to get it off, and I was a bit too impatient and I put a bit too pressure on, a bit too much pressure on one or two of the pins and uh, they shifted around, um, you know, so the actual inside of the pin came away from the ceramic. I ended up, you can see, I've just, this is just a mangled mess now. I'm not going to reuse that. This, uh, I guess you should learn from my pa lack of patience here. Um, I mean, it came off without damaging the board, but the problem is with this is just putting a little bit of pressure on these pins as I would normally do on any other type of um, dip package like this. And the, you can see the actual pins just sheared straight off with next to no pressure at all, whether it's the age of it, whether it's the manufacturer of this, uh, 
I haven't got a clue. I've never had that before. I've taken these off boards before without a problem. Um, but after they amp to one or two pins, I thought, sod it, I can't be bothered with this. I'm just going to go through. If they all break off, they break off, and that's what's happened. Because I've got about six of these spare from uh, other systems. So, um, other thing you should do while you're here, which I've just done, is um, where you've had, even when you've had a nice clean removal, I mean, obviously I haven't in my case, um, do some continuity tests on each one of these pins. Um, it's okay if you've got a, magn you know, a good magnifying um, solution where you can actually see what's going on, but continuity is really the only way to do it. And I've just sort of measured basic continuity, checked the tracks and followed every single one of these just to make sure that at the point of uh, sort of uh, you know exits and entry from the actual chip that everything's uh, connected up so I should be able to get the socket on here now right the socket's nice and uh, is in there now it's nice and loose um, and it's just to secure it so what I would recommend doing is, uh, is just to do hold it from underneath and just do four corner points and then press it in the middle just make sure you get the middle points done and then obviously solder all the remaining pins just a quick bit of me resoldering the socket. Well, I'm not resoldering, but soldering the socket on. You don't need very really much solder. So I've got the bit on each bit of the flux. Each point of the flux. Try and get a uniform sort of size, really. Sometimes I, uh, just, I apply more heat, you know, like it takes slightly longer on some of these just to make sure that you're heating right the way through the PCB to the other side. Um, sometimes you need a little bit more solder as well for this where you get connections that won't adhere very well due to the heat dissipation. Some of these have obviously got different thickness of tracks and pads and things, different sides of the boards and uh, some are easier to solder than others. The solder mask's a little bit damaged there. I can perhaps fix that later with some uh, special solder mask paint. Okay, that's the PCB after they've been cleaned up now. Um, I don't know if you can see that, it's not particularly uh, good without the macro mode being on. Um, it's come out quite clean, all the solder joints are uniform there. I mean, there's a bit of solder mask come off here, I can put a little bit of uh, the, the solder mask paint on there afterwards. Uh, so we've brought over, you can see, got a nice new socket on there now. Um, and it looks pretty tidy. So I'm going to get the new 68000 in there, reassemble this and uh, give it a test. Quickly reassembled and tested, um, and it's bad news. There's nothing wrong with work here, as far as I can tell. I mean, obviously, the continuity is good, the socket's fitted okay, the solder points are all good. Um, this is what you get. Pretty much a white screen. On the last one, is, you've got sort of strange calls and things as well, the other CPU. I've tried both of them. I'm pretty sure the CPUs work alright. It's um, actually some sort of incompatibility. I don't know whether it's um, to do with the cache on these. Or what? Um, I've got uh, another 68,000 here that will run at I think 8 megahertz. Um, I put that back in and it works fine, um, no problem at all. So I need to do a bit more research, but I've got the feeling that these, uh, the ones with the cache, the 16 megahertz ones, um, will not work in here for some reason. And uh, whether it's the instruction set that's slightly different, a couple of specific instructions that you know uh, just happen to be running when it's boot and toss. Um, I don't know, I'm not sure, I can't really, I've tried, I did do try doing a bit of research about that in advance of doing this and I couldn't really find very much. Um, so I suspect that I might need to put 12 megahertz one in there, which may mean I can only go to 12 megahertz. I might be able to overclock 12 megahertz, you know, with the 60, the 60 megahertz crystal that I've got. Um, a bit strange, I wasn't really expecting that, I was expecting that, because because it's configured as 8 megahertz now stock, other than the potential um, instruction different within, uh, difference within there, which you know you wouldn't expect, perhaps uh, certainly not on boot, maybe on one or two games or something. Um, anyway, let's see what happens. I'm going to put further now. I'm going to put my eight megahertz chip back in there and just have a play with my ST, make sure it's working on. Right. Just having a, a think about this actually after I've got this back together. I mean, there's a few things um, that could be um, related to why those uh, 16 megahertz <coughs> chips don't work. Um, I mean, the first first thing that I need to think about is obviously the, the, the CPU that's near now is not the CPU that shipped with this. That is, if I can grab it, this mangled one. Um, this is not beyond repair. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to straighten up every one of the edges of those um, so that the, you know the head apart is uh, nice and straight, um, and then stick it into a 68,000 socket 
and solder. Uh, it's one of these. It's the same type of socket as this I've got and solder. Um, that the, you know the head, the heads of those directly onto that socket, and then I'll have a socket that I can actually plug directly in there. And, you know, it'll be reused. Um, the only thing of concern with this, uh, one of the reasons why I got a bit narked with it and just literally ripped it off there in the end because I was quite annoyed. I don't know if you can see some of the some of the pins there stick out further like that top one, and it's almost like it's detached from the die inside, and that was. That was at the point where I almost thought this is beyond, you know, one pin break or two pins break at the front. And uh, as soon as I saw one of those pins shift out like that, I thought, you know, there's more at play here. This is, you know, whether it's the age of the thing um, or what, I don't know. I've never seen that before. 60, I mean, 64 pin dips are never going to be easy to remove, really, unless you, you're really experienced. And I don't do that much soldering these days. Um, that said, I mean, I've removed a ton of chips off Amigas. Uh, in the last few months uh, and never damaged the track and stuff and it's uh, never damaged the chips either you know I've, I've often been able to just re-socket and stick them on sockets afterwards and it's not been a problem but you know just be really patient if you're going to try and do this uh, you know a similar mod where you're dealing with a uh, 64 pin dip like this take your time um, and just hope you don't get the problems I've had with this um, I do think the chip is the problem here because it literally used no force at all and then the pin just broke off and like I say by the time it got to somewhere in the middle there one of them shifted, like I say, I think it was, I don't know if I can touch it, I think it's that one there, I don't know if you can see that, it's protruded, it's almost like, like I say, it's come off the die inside, it might still be soldered by the miniature wires or whatever they use inside, but I don't know, um, I think that's an 8 megahertz chip, I don't know if you can see it's upside down, it's a 68000 C8 N64, I'm guessing that means 8 megahertz 64. Uh, I'm not familiar with that manufacturer, but it's a generic 68000 processor. I, I think that'll be okay. I mean, as you can hear in the background there, the LED storm demo's working. It's the music's just stopped because it's waiting for disc two and stuff. Um, but the, yeah, there's a few more things at play as I started off saying a minute or two ago with these. Is the cash? You know, that's in the back of my mind thinking these these chips have cash. Um, also, when I think back to the circuit diagram for this, the actual mod, you know, that allows you to switch between eight and sixteen megahertz. Um, not sure whether there's any modification in that circuit to accommodate the fact that you might have a 16 megahertz, you know, this particular type of chip running at 8 megahertz. Uh, I can't think what that would be in my mind. You know, you know, my whole theory behind this was, well, okay, well, I thought I'll, before I do any of the actual mods to be able to switch to 16 megahertz, I'll just plug a 16 megahertz chip in. That should work and I'll test it and I'll run all the games and demos and everything and use it for two or three weeks until I'm comfortable that the um, you know the instruction set and the cache is not breaking too many things uh, you know I kind of accepted the cache was going to cause some issues with some games some demos um, but that said most of the ones that have been um, modified or hacked if you like to work with uh, Ultra Satan and you know sort of the various configs of different types of ST including the uh, SG and the TT um, they're usually you know a lot of the loaders when you start them they've got an option there to enable or disable cache support and choose whether it's 16 megahertz or 8 megahertz or whatever so I kind of figured that that would um, wouldn't be a problem but um, I don't know and then the final thing I guess with these is um, I don't know whether these work do you know what I mean I'm, I mean they both do exactly the same so I'm assuming they probably do work um, but still you know I'm, I don't know I'm a little bit uh, Confused. I'm a bit out of my depth, I guess, with uh, with this. I'm going to post on the Atari uh, forum and see, because I know a few of the guys have used this same chip to do this, and see what they can um, advise, really. Whilst I've just swapped out this uh, 68,000 for a fully, you know, working one, I guess you could say. With uh, decent pins, this is the old uh, the old one I took off. That's uh, still in a mess, but um, I've straightened up the edges as, uh, as best as I can. Um, part of the straightening off process, that one of those pins that was pretty weak, uh, that's just snapped off there. But I just want to show you that even a chip as in a state as that can be completely salvaged. You get one of these um, sockets with the uh, circular holes. Uh, forget the correct name for it, and uh, try and straighten your pins as much as you can. Um, what you can do is just solder directly onto this socket and I'm probably, I might, might do this one, I don't know whether it's worth wasting the socket or not I know that this, chances are this is probably okay um, even with the state it's in but um, when you get a pin like that 
if you get Dremel and put it on the uh, gr put a grind head on it, you know, obviously a pretty thin one. You don't want too thick, you might end up grinding too much. Um, and uh, basically grind in the direction, sort of that direction, so that um, the bot, you know, the, as it turns that way, it's you know, sort of grinding towards you. Um, and just grind around there, and you get down to the point where you can actually solder onto that connection there without an issue, and uh, and just bridge it straight to that point there. Um, and once that's actually soldered on there, because the edges are sort of pretty much covered with the bottom of the edges are covered with solder, you wouldn't really be able to, uh, you know, you wouldn't look at it and go, oh my god, what a mess. You'd look at it and go, okay, well, someone salvaged, salvaged a processor or whatever. Um, I guess it's just a tip, really. I just hope people learn from uh, this video uh, how not to remove for 68,000, really. The problem with these is, um, one of the things I've noticed with this, when I came to straighten these pins, is uh, the, the metal is really, really brittle. It's like it takes, I can move that with my thumb, just like just touching it. It's just like really, really soft. It's, it's um, I don't know whether it's the aging or what. Um, these were made in Korea. It's a genuine Motorola one, so I don't know, I'm surprised. But when I compare this to other 68,000 chips I've got, in fact, any other chips I've got, pins do not bend this easy it was, you know, most of those, the, the, the bits that were hanging on there they just fell straight off with no, you know, there's just nothing holding them on, on at all um, anyway, thanks for watching see you soon